Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon. We were off yesterday, but apparently the long weekend wasn't long enough for one of us. Never fear, Bill and Frank is here. You knew I'd yeah, show up. Yeah, that's on right. Tuesday. No fear, no fear whatsoever. You know, I Maybe was a just fear. at a place where they had cactus. I was in Vegas, you were on the East Coast. Ooh, I come back, I you know. leave. I'm starting to take it personal at this point. I may go to Vegas tomorrow. I might be a little late, though. Welcome yeah, to PTI. Victor, Victor left. Tony apparently couldn't make it all the way down to his basement today, so I am happy to be joined by our great friend, Frank Isola. Uh, I hear it. I like yeah. it. <laughs> we'll begin with something that won't sound such a happy note. The firing yesterday of Northwestern head football coach Pat Fitzgerald. The school that originally suspended Fitz for two weeks following an investigation into hazing within the football program. But over the weekend, the student newspaper, The Daily Northwestern, published details of the alleged hazing, some of it sexual and racial in nature, and Fitzgerald was terminated last night. Frank, you're not very far removed from the Northwestern yeah. scene yourself. Your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, it's, it's a troubling story. It makes you angry. It makes you sad in some respects as well. And, yeah, I have a connection to the school. That's in the last decade, though. I mean, this has been your life. And, you know, I'll, I'll be quick because I want to hear what you have to say about this. When you, you know, it's the administration, it's the football program, it's the journalism department, the student newspaper. No one knows that ecosystem better than you do. And on Friday, when this story came out, Mike, I really thought we were, there was a chance that we were going to end up here. It felt like a yeah. Friday news dump in a lot of ways and give the student newspaper a lot of credit. They got the player, the whistleblower. He revealed the details. Now, the president of the school, Michael Schill, said that, he, well, we were aware of all this stuff. Well, why did you only suspend him for two weeks originally? Yep. Then you had a weekend Amen. to think about it. Then you terminate him. But I do think this, and this is one thing that I do agree with the president on, where he did say the head coach is ultimately responsible for the culture of the team. Pat Fitzgerald, that's his players. That's yep. his locker room. That's his job. And his top priority is the safety and well-being of those players. And I think he left the school with no other choice. Once you read everything that happened, I think they left, he left them with no other choice than to be terminated. Frank, I, I agree with every word you said. And, and when you talk about the responsibility of a coach, you're talking about to the parents who send their child at 17 or 18 years old, as, as you yep, did, to, right. to that campus. And that's any campus, not just ours, but we're talking about mine now. I'm an uh, alum. I've been a trustee for close to 15 years. I worked for that student newspaper, the Daily Northwestern, proudly, and I think they did a hell of a job, and I've told some of their reporters that in the last couple of days. Let me get to the tough part. Pat Fitzgerald has been the face of Northwestern football. He's been the most famous person in the athletic community we've ever had. Yep. In well over 150 years, Pat Fitzgerald. He raised the profile of the football team and the program to a point where now that he's been fired, other coaches are calling people like me saying, I want that job. That's not a bad job, even with all that's going on. But, Frank, you're right about where we had to get. When I heard about this Friday, I mean, it, it killed me. It devastated me. I'm a season ticket holder. I, I'm a trustee, as I said. I go there, as you know, all the time to events. Pat Fitzgerald is somebody that I have gotten to know. But the school couldn't move past it. And it wasn't any longer about if he knew, he says he didn't, or when he might have known, when people say he must have. You get past that. This was not a tornado. This was a tidal wave. And opinion inside the university and outside of it bombarded us. And it became clear we could not move on with status quo. It never should have been a two-week suspension. Mike Schill yep. is a new president. He's barely been inaugurated. He just got there. Yeah. I don't know that anybody can walk onto a campus and be perfectly prepared for something like this. But I first feel, first, for the kids affected, impacted by a hazing scandal, yep. fraternities and sororities have been banned from many a campus in the United That's States right. of America forever. So football teams can't have this. It's not the 70s and the 80s. And so do my friends even who call and say, wait a minute. You guys fired Pat Fitzgerald for this? The answer is in 2023, yes. You get fired for this. You can't have this. You have to be able to put one foot in front of the other and welcome people back to this program, Frank, and let parents know, mothers and fathers and children, it's okay. This is not going to happen. 
We're not going to have it. We hold ourselves out as a university with a high bar. We better live up to it. We've not done that now. We haven't done it lately. We have to do that, and we could not do that with status quo. I feel for everybody involved, man, but it's been a, it's been a difficult time. Do I think we can make it out of it and dig our way out? Yes. Yes, yep. there's scandals all the time now that people dig their way out of. We're gonna, we may lose a ton of kids in the transfer portal. A new dynamic, charismatic coach can pull kids right out of a transfer portal to a school that's still top 10 academically. So I'm, I guess I'm ready to turn the page at some point and get started with what's and, new. And, you know, the, and the one thing about Pat Fitzgerald, he was, to your point, Northwestern football. He played there and assistant yes. coach there, head coach there. And, you know, Northwestern, I, I get that they built that incredible practice facility. They want to build a stadium. But they kind of had a realistic look at what the football program was. I mean, he is 4-20 and 20 in the last two seasons, and no one was talking about the record. So he was going to be there for as long as yes. he wanted to be there. He had just started a 10-year, $57 million contract. But I'll say this, Michael, and you know this from the Penn State situation. We have not heard the end of this story. There's going to be no. a lot of fallout over the days and weeks, and credit to the Daily Northwestern for really being out in front of this story and breaking the biggest part of it as well. And a baseball program now with this coach being questioned right. legitimately so as well. A lot, yeah. lot on well, our plates, Frank. Yeah. Well, speaking of the Daily Northwestern, that takes us to the New York Times and their decision to disband its own sports department. The, time, the Times announced its decision yesterday, saying it would reassign its 35-person staff to other areas of the paper and turning over most sports-related coverage to The Athletic, which it purchased 18 months ago. All right, Michael, how do you feel about this decision by The New York Times? Sick. Second straight story. Yeah. I feel sick. I, I got on a plane this morning to fly from D.C. out here to the desert, and I look at the Washington Post, and I, in the style section, it teases to this story. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, they don't want the news anymore. Uh, they, 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 the New York Times, and by the way, the L.A. Times, this, Frank, this is the first nail in the coffin, the death of sports, of sports writing, the profession yeah. that you and I, you know, Broken, rode right. into these positions on as know-it-alls. This is what we did. And the New York Times just seems lazy and gutless and so corporate that they wanted to make another buck after spending $550 million reportedly on The Athletic. And I'm not saying The Athletic is not competent, because I got too many friends like David Aldridge and people who have been great journalists. I, I get that. But Burkow, Ayrton, Roden, yeah. Roberts, and the list goes on and on. And you know them because you, the, you read them daily. I get The New York Times delivered to my house. I'm going to stop it. It yeah. looks like a union bust in some ways. It disgusts yes. me in different ways than what happens what's happening at my alma mater right now, but it disgusts me. It's the New York Times. It's one of the great sports sections, one always one of the three to five best sports sections, Boston Globe, Washington Post, L.A. Times. I'll just throw some in there, Philly. In the last hundred years, and now yep. they don't want to cover sports. They don't want to do it. We're going to fold it into our economics coverage. And just middle management, I, I, God, I hate this. I hate this story, too. You know, there was an uproar at the New York Times when they put the sports section into the metro section, where it wasn't going to be its own section. You, you go back over the years, Sports Monday and the great Sunday sports section that they had. Yes. You rattled off some of those names. And by names. the way, the great, Dave Anderson, the great Dave Anderson. The great Dave Anderson being able to read Dave Anderson my whole life. Yeah, and, and you mentioned Ira Burkow on basketball. My neighbor, Harvey Arden, who's in the Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame. Selena Roberts, I covered the Knicks with her. My buddy Dave Walstein who's covering Wimbledon right now. And what happened was, and you mentioned the corporate side of it, they spend so much money on the athletic, and I, this is a way to save face. And now you're going to have the athletic taking over the sports department. And I'll tell you what, Alex Mather, who founded the athletic, said this was about six years ago. He had that quote, and he got destroyed for saying it. And I worked at the athletic for about a year and a half, two years. He had said, you know, we're looking to bleed these papers until we're the last yeah. one standing. Well, guess what? Yeah. You yeah. just killed off the biggest paper of them all, and it's a, it's a sad day when something like this happens because you see what great journalism could be and what the New York Times always was, what the Daily yes. Northwestern just did. Those are the kind of stories how, that they would break. How about, how about concussions? No one talked about concussions in the NFL to the New York Times. Yeah. Did that incredible award-winning reporting on concussions in, 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 in the NFL. And... I mean, change the way even the game is played now, some of that reporting. I, I believe you can draw a direct line from the Times reporting to that. 
look, as a person who wrote for the Washington Post for 30 years, there's no more worthy competitor than the New York Times all my life. Guys I competed against, and now I find out that they, they shut their sports desk down? It's embarrassing. No sports section. You're right. It's You're right. No sports section, no separate. It's just embarrassing. Embarrassing. And now to the NBA Summer League, returning to actual sort of sports news, where the Spurs have shut down the Victor Wimbanyama experience after, you know, two games. The top pick in the draft struggled in Friday night's debut, shooting just two for 13 from the field. But with Coach Pop in the stands again Sunday, Wimbanyama bounced back. 27 points, Frank, in 27 minutes. So how would you grade Wimby's summer league performance? Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be there on Sunday, and he did play well, so I'm going to give him a B. Can we at least acknowledge that offensively on Friday night he didn't play well? It's not doesn't mean that we're writing the book on his career, but he did not have a great game offensively. No. Defensively, he no. looked okay, and he even admitted after the game, I didn't know what I was doing out there. And he I came back and played it. really well. Exactly. And we know how it works. It's Friday night. The game's being hyped. It's sold out there at the Thomas and Mack Center. They, you know, the last time they sold out a game was probably Zion's game, of, you know, four years ago, yeah. his first summer yeah, league game. it was. But, you know, you talk to coaches. I spoke to Nick Nurse uh, a day after the game. He was actually impressed with uh, Victor Wenbenyama's first game. He thought his vision was good, the passing. He moves. He has an understanding of the game. But let's face it, Mike. He needs to bulk up just a little bit. Ooh, I mean, he looks, ooh, he's nimble. Ooh, I get ooh. it, but you also look like you could break him in two. My goodness. It, it does look like that. Now worry about it because there were some 6'3 guys going right through him on the way to the basket yep. in the first game. Okay, I'm going to grade a little differently. I'm going to give him an A in part right. because he was so substandard, I'm sure, below his own bar in the first game. Because he played so f poorly on offense in the first game. And by the way, the kid can pass it. And the five block shots he had, he blocked the, the second pick in the draft, Miller. He blocked his three pointer. And it, right. I that mean, was... it was unbelievable that. So, so, because he had a bad game, we can call it a bad game. It doesn't mean we want to kill him or get rid of him or don't want to have him on our teams. He had a bad game. And he came back and had a terrific game. And because he did that, and because of the way he can cr criticize, critique himself, and not take himself too seriously, but seems to hold himself to a standard. What I've seen so far is I love the kid. You want to see how they bounce back from a bad game? We just saw it. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a break. Coming up, Vlad Jr. won the home run derby. But was his performance the most impressive of the night? And Reds rookie Ile De La Cruz has been doing such amazing things on the field. Should he be playing wow. in tonight's All-Star game? Wow. How about it? Yeah. Absolutely. Let's get to some By good the way, news. a lot of people are saying... Where's Michael Wilbon? Then I explained to them, you are watching Spooky basketball. Nook. They all understood. Spooky they all Nook, understood. Pennsylvania. They were happy watching, watching other basketball. Time to fill in some blanks with fill in Frank. Let's get the first one from the producer over the loudspeaker. The most impressive player in the home run derby was blank. All right, we know Vlad won the home run derby, Frank, but I'm going to say J-Rod in front of the hometown fans in Seattle hitting 41 home runs in that, in that one round and basically getting rid of Pete Alonzo, which for those of us who hate the Mets, that's a great thing. <laughs> and he also saved him, saved Ken Griffey to, to be the only, speaking of more Mariners, to be the only guy to win three, you know, straight home run derby contests. I thought all that, to do that in front of the home fans was great. Made him the star of the yeah. night. Well, that's why it's Vlad Guerrero Jr., because he knocked your guy out, Julio Rodriguez. And you know that in 2019, Vlad hit 91 total home runs and didn't win it. He wanted that's to crazy. win it this year. 16 years after his dad won it, but his dad used yeah. to go with bare hands. Vlad's going with the batting gloves when he hits. But it was Vlad Guerrero Jr. See how happy he was when he won it? 
pretty cool for the father and the son to both win it 16 it years. It is. Before. And, you know, I thought, the, I thought that the fielders had done that, and they didn't, even though they each hit 50. And nobody else has done that father's son. But very cool, cool for Vlad and for his dad, who must, have, must be happy for him. Yeah. What's next? An all-star game without Ellie De La Cruz is blank. Okay, Frank, he hasn't played that many games yet. I mean, he, I don't even know if he's played 40 30. games yet. 30. But Ellie 30 De La Cruz, games. between the stolen bases, and I know the stolen bases go in second, third home, and you're not paying attention, and you let him steal home like that. I mean, that's in the <laughs> category. That's like, that's in Jackie Robinson territory. That's it's the only yep. person you want to put. But it's the catch he made. In the same series yeah. against the Brewers, against the Cheeseheads, I was so happy to see it. That's Willie Mays written on that catch. He goes into short left field over the shoulder basket catch. Are you kidding me? One of the great catches of all time. And so the word is less exciting. The All-Star game is less yeah. exciting without Ellie De La Cruz. Yeah. That's why I think the word is short-sighted. And you kind of glossed over that stolen base. That was three bases, two pitches, and 30 seconds. How exciting was that? And if you're Major League Baseball, you're looking to draw younger audience to the game yeah. itself, not just the All-Star game. Have him play there. He's got the great look. He's well, exciting right now. He's the most exciting young player. And the team is competing for a playoff spot. They are. He's been They're the breakout star right now of the, the season. Division. Put him in the All-Star. Yeah, all true. What do you all want? You want one designated... You want a designated last-second guy that managers can add, like, like the morning of the All-Star game? Why not? He'll fly. He'll run out there. <laughs> he doesn't even need a plate. <laughs> That's the final word. Let's take one last break, but still to come. A number one seed goes down at Wimbledon. And Bob Huggins says he deserves his job back at West Virginia. Can we Virginia. just say right now, no, he doesn't. Good luck with that. No, <laughs> Good luck with that. he doesn't. Spoiler alert. Not, no, Bob not Huggins does not deserve his job back. Please. No. Tonight on SportsCenter at 6 Eastern, live from Las Vegas with the latest comments from Zion and the Pelicans' plans for their franchise player. Plus, after the firing of Pat Fitzgerald, what's next for the Northwestern football program and their former coach? And six days away from the deadline, where do the Giants and Saquon stand on a long-term deal? SportsCenter, 6 Eastern on ESPN. It's happy time, people. Happy 57th birthday, Rod Strickland. Rod came to national fame as an All-American point guard for the DePaul Blue Demons, leading them to three straight tournament berths and two Sweet 16s. He was selected 19th overall in the first round by the New York Knicks, the first of nine different NBA franchises he played for in 17 seasons, with career averages of 13 points and seven dimes a game, which doesn't speak to his flair. After playing, he worked in administrative roles with Coach Cal at Memphis and Kentucky before becoming an assistant in South Florida, and now is head coach at Long Island University. Should make Kornheiser happy. He loves Rod like I do. And he's coaching his sons, too. I always, I always give Rod a hard time. How does a guy from Harry Truman High School in the Bronx, New York, end up at DePaul? Was that NIL money back in the hey, 80s, Mike? How hey, exactly watch did out that now. work? What are you suggesting? By the way, we liked his teammate Rod. in high school was Kyrie Irving's dad, Dredrick. And he's Kyrie Irving's godfather. One of my all-time favorite players, Rod Strickland. Hot Rod, baby. Happy anniversary, Bo Jackson. On this day 33 years ago, you authored an iconic highlight when you chased down a long fly ball in Baltimore's Memorial Stadium and then ran along the wall like Spider-Man. A few years ago, Bo explained the move to journalism students at Auburn, quote, at the angle I was running if I had crashed into the wall, I probably would have re-injured my shoulder, so instead of crashing into it, I just decided to do what I used to do when I was a kid and just run up the wall and come back down. That seemed easier to me and logical, close quote. <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago, Bo celebrated the 34th anniversary of breaking a bat over his head by tweeting, I wouldn't allow that bat to betray anyone else ever again. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is a great quote. I'll tell you what, Bo Jackson, scouts swear that he was the fastest going from home to first, which remember, he's right-handed. So he has a longer way That's to right. go. And Mike, tell That's the right. young kids how good Bo Jackson was as a two-sport uh, two star. 
football and baseball. Just that was I like mean, a if, different he, level he, athlete. Hall of Fame talent in both. Absolutely. Incredible. Happy Incredible. trails to Iga Sviantek. The number one seed on the women's side fell to Ukrainian Elena Svitolina in three sets today's quarterfinal. This is actually as far as Sviantek has ever gotten in Wimbledon. She's won three French Opens and a U.S. Open. Fourth seed to Jessica Pagula is also out, losing in three to Czech Markita Vondrosova, excuse me. One very notable result from the men's side, 27-year-old American Christopher Eubanks upsetting fifth seeded Stefano Tsitsipas in five sets to make the quarters where he will now face third seed Daniel Medvedev. Big match tomorrow, Frank. Yeah, and Eubanks is from Georgia Tech. They're, his fellow Americans are calling him the toothpick. How about Slitovina, who was a, gave birth in October and had a great win the other that? day against Azarenka. What a win that was today against the number one seed. Great job by her. All right, no errors today, so we're going to run to the big finish. Bob Huggins said he never submitted a resignation and should still be employed by West Virginia. Your thoughts? This sounds like a way to get money out of West Virginia, does it not, Mike? It kind of sounds yeah. like that. Yeah. Adam Silver, who was in Las Vegas, he said that Vegas and Seattle would be under consideration if the league decides to expand. You like those choices? Logical. You got to go to Vegas, and Seattle never should have been without a franchise. Never. Never. Good, uh, PGA Tour COO Ron Price told Congress that the level of Saudi funding in a merger would be north of $1 billion. Frank, your thoughts? Oh, so that's why they did it. They did it for the money. I didn't, I couldn't figure that out. Tyson Fury <laughs> has agreed to box former MMA heavyweight champ Francis Ngannou. Are you intrigued? Ngannou's a tough dude. That's a one-round fight. Tyson Fury will hit him once, somewhere right around here, and he's done. Last one, MLB All-Star Game tonight. Who you got? Dusty Baker said he put out a good lineup. I like the American League. We're out of time. Okay. Thanks for watching. I'm Frank Isola. I want to see if Elena Deladonna is going to play for the Mystics against the Storm tonight, so I got to click. I'm Mike Wilbon. <laughs> Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get PTI's podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcast. And now, here's SportsCenter. PTI.